The Fall of Sharanian starts off with an author's note. I spent a lot of time debating where to place this section, based on what we know of the old lore of Sharanian, the kingdom, had been around for hundreds of years in Assyria, and their territory encompassed not just Ellen Forest, but much of the area around it. Nearly all of this territory eventually splits from Assyria and becomes Victoria Islands. The Golem Temple in Henesis was built by the kingdom, and the stone golems were created to guard the area. The ant tunnels deep underground were also carved out by their people as proving grounds. The original lore states that King Sharanian III was obsessed with the Rubian, a gem so said to grant eternal life, and summoned the evil Urgoth Dunamis to safeguard it. However, Urgoth covets the power of the Rubian for himself, causing the kingdom to fall to ruin and turning the area into a dry wasteland that we know today as Perion. Most of this stays consistent with the new changes added from the Sharanian Knights chapter in the Grand Anthenaeum. With the exception of the Rubian, instead of having the power to heal any sickness and revive the dead, though the Rubian doesn't actually have any real power, as well as the Black Mage somehow being involved with the fall of Sharanian, essentially what happens is that the Knights are stuck in a time loop for century after Sharanian falls, and the Black Mage takes advantage of this. However, we don't know at what point the Black Mage gets involved, and so we're placing this section at the earliest point in the Maple World's history, as we can assume that the time loop begins much earlier than the birth of the White Mage. Alright, Maple World was one of the three worlds created by the Overseers. It was a large realm with many different species and civilizations. On the largest continent of Assyria was the Kingdom of Sharanian, one of the oldest civilizations in Maple World. Sharanian was built amongst lush, lush vegetation, and its knights were famous throughout the Maple World for hunting devils. Author's note: The Sharanian Knight storyline states that hunting demon that they were hunting demons, but as this would lead to confusion with the demon race from Tynarium or Tynarum rather, I'll be referring to them as devils, which seems to be another established way to refer to them from older storylines that covered the events of Sharanian. Sharanian was ruled by King Sharon III, with his bastard son, Prince Sharon IV, next in line to succeed him. King Sharon suffered from madness and soon came to suspect that his son was trying to overthrow him. He summoned guard captain Kelid, the prince's teacher in combat, and ordered him to kill Prince Sharon. But Kelid refused and attempted to convince the king to see reason. Furious, King Sharon branded Kelid a traitor and attempted to have him executed. However, Prince Sharon was able to convince his father to merely have Kelid dismissed from the court. Though Kelid's life was saved, he was devoted to he was demoted to commander and ordered to lead the Sharenian Defense Unit, a squad of knights who had been rejected from becoming official Sharenian knights. The Sharenian Defense Unit was then forced to go on menial missions rather than hunting devils. They were frequently sent on missions to hunt small moles that were pestering the local farmers, causing them to be known as the Mole Slayers. Author's note. It is said that devils are apparently distant ancestors of moles. I guess it puts a new perspective on the Mole King from Elenel Fairy Academy. One day, Commander Kellid was leading his unit, composed of Harden, Ein, Ryan, Keg, and Ed. I'm going to assume it's Keg. Sorry, I don't know all the pronunciations for these names. On a mission to hunt moles. When a Sharenian knight arrived and cryptically told Kellid that someone from the palace was waiting for him. As he returned to the palace, Kellid recalled how he used to inter instruct the prince in the art of battle, and how they would often gaze out upon the kingdom at sunset and take in its beauty. Though it often scared Kellid, since he knew that all things of beauty would one day fade, including Sharenian itself. To his surprise, the prince greeted him at the kingdom's outskirts, and said that he still recalled Kellid's words. Kellid told him that he was surprised that Sharon had come to see him against the wishes of his father, to which the prince told him that he was only an apprentice coming to see his master. When Kellid asked if there was trouble at the palace, Prince Sharon told him that his father had lost his mind, obsessed with the Rubian, a gem said to cure any ailment or revive the dead. The prince told Kellid that the king had spent years scouring the country, for it while researching dark sorceries to help him in his quest. 
Recently, the king had gone as far as summoning a devil. Kellid told Sharon that the king wouldn't succeed, which the prince agreed with, but said that he couldn't stand by and watch his father's descent into madness. Because of this, the prince planned to usurp his father's throne in order to shop sh stop Sharinian from falling to ruin. He promised to come see Kellid again after he succeeded, and hoped that Kellid would agree to serve as his knights when the time came. After he returned, his squad told him that they had seen him speaking with the prince and agreed to help him in case Sharenian faced great peril, though Kellid reassured them that nothing would happen. A few days later, Prince Sharon successfully executed his coup against his father, who shouted that he knew that the prince had been plotting against him. In his madness, he ordered guard captain Kellid to appear at his side, forgetting that he had dismissed Kellid from the court. The prince ordered his knights to arrest his father and find the Rubian. The king declared that he wouldn't allow Prince Sharon to steal the throne or the Rubian, and summoned the devil, e Urgoth Dunmus, to protect him. However, Urgoth coveted the power of the Rubian for himself and turned on the king. Meanwhile, the Sharenian defense unit watched the battle in the palace from a distance, frustrated that they were forced to remain on a standby. Just then, their squad mate Kig arrived from the palace and reported that all members of the armed forces had been ordered to assemble at the palace as, as the king had been killed. Upon arriving at the palace, they were shocked to find the guards dead, with one fleeing knight warning them to get far away. He told them that King Sharon had summoned a devil, resulting in his death, and possibly the princes as well, who had gone missing. Kellid's knights agreed that they needed to find Prince Sharon, though Kellid feared that he would be leading his knights to their death for nothing if the prince had already been killed. As Kellid's mind began spinning, his knights reassured him that they were all up to the task. His mind cleared, Kellid ordered his knights to split up in order to search for the prince. The knights fought through the devils that invaded the palace and attempted to rescue any survivors. As Keg fought methodically, Ed jokingly asked if he was an arcane construct, an automaton that the palace sorcerers had been rumored to have built. Author's note, this is basically confirmed later on, meaning that Kig is some type of cyborg. Kig ignored the question and asked Kellid whether their priority was to kill the devil or to save the prince. Kellid told him it was neither and reminded his knights that their mission as Sharenian knights was to protect the people of Sharenian. They then entered the throne room, where they found Urgoth sitting on the throne with a mortally wounded Prince Sharon on the ground. Kellid and the other knights engaged Urgoth, but nearly all of them were killed. Kellid held a dying Sharen, Sharen in his arms, who begged Kellid to uphold his promise to protect Sharenian before giving him the Rubian. Urgoth then cursed the knights into reliving the fall of Sharenian for all eternity, forcing them to uphold their pledge to guard their kingdom forever. To everyone's surprise, all of their squad was revived and sent back to the time before they first entered the palace. Kellid reminded them that their mission was still to protect the people of Sharenian by killing Urgoth before he cursed them again. They once again split up and fought past the devil invaders. Kellid, recalling Urgoth's curse and Sharon's dying wish, began to believe that defending the kingdom forever was all that he wanted. They entered the throne room once again and managed to defeat Urgoth, though they were unable to save Prince Sharon, who once again begged Kellid to uphold his promise before giving him the Rubian and dying. Urgoth then cursed the knights once again, forcing them to go back in time. Kellid and his knights made a slew of attempts and tried many strategies to defeat Urgoth. However, they came to realize several things. First, they had to accept that Prince Sharon was beyond saving, no matter how quickly they arrived. Second, defeating Urgoth even before he cursed them, didn't break the time loop. Finally, the longer it took them to reach Urgoth, the stronger he became. They eventually found the body of King Sharon and learned Urgoth's name from the book he was clutching. Ayn also learned that Urgoth's true body was in the other world, while a duplicate formed in their world, with the original body transmitting its strength to the duplicate in somewhere between 12 and 24 hours, which was how he, s he grew stronger the longer it took the knights to reach him. Arden asked why their fatigue hadn't been reset at the beginning of the time loop, to which Ayn explained that their physical fatigue was reset, but their mental fatigue still remained. 
The knights continued in the time loop, each time defeating Urgoth and watching the prince breathe his last breath before going back to the beginning. On the 22nd day, Kelid asked Ayn how far such a curse would extend, given that a demon of such magnitude as Urgoth had cast it. He clarified his meaning and asked if the devil was turning back time for the whole world or only for them. Ayn told him that it was impossible to turn back time for the whole world, no matter how powerful Urgoth was, as it would violate all, knowns, all known laws of metaphysics. She suspected that he had created a bubble for just Sherenian and noted that the halo around the sun indicated that two adjacent regions of space-time had fallen out of sync. Ryan suggested that they simply leave, but Ayn told them that Urgoth's curse kept them trapped in Sherenian and that Urgoth would continue growing stronger if they left him alone. Ed and Hardin then suggested that someone from the outside world could enter or that Urgoth's strength would eventually fail. Ayn then wondered if they were merely trapped in an illusion that made it appear though they were in a time loop. Hardin told them that they shouldn't doubt their own eyes, as otherwise they wouldn't trust anything, including each other. They continued fighting Urgoth over and over again, and though Kellid reassured them that nothing, nothing lasted forever, including the time loop, he and his knights felt more uncertain than reassured. As they continued fighting, some of the knights began feeling uneasy about how many times they had to watch the people of the palace die, unable to save them even once. The countless waves of devils kept them from resting, adding to their mental fatigue, with the exception of Keeg. As they, as they grew more frustrated, the knights began fighting amongst themselves. Soon after, Hardin heard someone screaming, though no one else heard anything. Keeg suspected that they were suffering from sleep deprivation, which was causing hallucinations. One by one, all the knights, including Kellig, fell, fell prey to these hallucinations. Kellig then recalled the memories of when he stopped King Sharon from killing the prince. His memories of that incident were then warped into the prince asking Kellig why he had abandoned him. Over a thousand days later, the knights had grown sick of fighting and asked if they could try leaving the kingdom. Kellid refused, claiming that they had to uphold their oath, though Ryan asked if Kellid expected them to just keep fighting forever. As the knights argued amongst themselves, Kellid noticed that they were growing more aggressive in their fighting styles. Kellid was plagued by nightmares of the prince accusing him of valuing his pride and honor over saving him. Eventually, Hardin accidentally wounded Ed, causing Ayn to yell at him that the wounds that they had inflicted upon each other didn't get healed by the time loop, but Kellid then reminded her that Ed had been wounded several cycles ago. He explained that they had tried to let him leave Sherenian on his own, but an invisible barrier kept him there, and that he had been slowly losing his health over the next several cycles. Soon after, Ed stopped moving and finally passed away after a dozen more cycles. With his death, the other knights began to falter and slowly began losing their sanity. Nevertheless, Kellid persisted, desperately clinging on to the promise he made to Prince Sharon. After defeating Urgoth once more, Kellid admonished Hardin for his sloppy sword skills. Hardin then began to hear Ed's voice screaming, though Ryan kept insisting that Ed was fine. Upon remembering that Ed had died, Ayn wondered if it had all been her fault, though Hardin realized that the blame fell on him. Suddenly, Ed appeared out of nowhere and told them that Ryan's loose arrow had killed him. Kellid was shocked that everyone was experiencing a shared hallucination, just as Ed told them that he that they could still save him, pointing out the ruby in Kellid's hands, which Prince Sharon had given him once again before dying. Ein begged Kellen to use the ruby to save Ed, but Hardin argued that they should use it to save the girl that he had watched die from a devil's attack. Ryan then suggested that they revive King Sharon, as he was the one who summoned Urgoth and may know how to banish him. Kellid told them that they couldn't use the Rubian on anyone, causing Ainz to accuse him of wanting to save the prince, whom she claimed he loved more than his own friends. The knight then began to turn the knights then began to turn on their commander. Believing that Kellid had forced them to stay in this time loop not to protect the kingdom, but to save the prince. Soon, Keeg began to waver, unable to recall what his mission was. With no other choice, Kellid told Keeg that his, his mission was to eliminate his former comrades. 
Teague then began to fight the other knights, resulting in everyone being fatally injured and the Rubian shattering before their eyes. Helid revealed that the Rubian was a fake, merely an ordinary gemstone. With his dying breath, Ryan asked what Kellid's mission asked about Kellid's mission, as he still believed that Kellid had promised the prince to return him back to life. Kellid then revealed that his promise had always been to protect Sherenian, and as part of his pledge, Kellid had been asked to destroy the Rubian somewhere all could see in order to prevent another mad king from rising to cover covet its power. Upon the death of Kellid's knights, Urgoth's curse was 